Uh, hey, welcome back to the Astro Vision Channel. Tonight's session, the making of the Cave Nebula image. Uh, Eric Coles, who uh, you guys probably hear him comment uh, every so often in our sessions. He's almost always here live. Um, he won an APOD for this image, and uh, you can probably see why. Uh, and, and come to think of it, I don't have uh, his image on my computer right now, so you're going to have to see it off his computer. But before I go into that, uh, I'm going to show you this week's image of the week. And uh, bear with me just a sec. Uh, there you go. Uh, M27 by Nicholas Kazilian. Uh, beautiful uh, rendition of the Dumbbell Nebula. And uh, what are we doing these days when we're shooting the Dumbbell Nebula uh, in narrowband? We're basically trying to uh, reveal that outer shell as much as possible. He did a great job here. Uh, along with the outer shell, he uh, revealed uh, a lot of sharp internal detail. Uh, just an excellent image. So congrats, Nicholas. And uh, as you guys know, you can go onto our website and submit your images of the week right there. Uh, it'll ask you for all the info at the bottom of the page. And then you're up for consideration. I do get them in my email, too. And while I don't post them all, I do put them up for consideration. But uh, if you do put them up here, everyone else can comment on them. And... Uh, just uh, kind of cool to share. Uh, that said, uh, let me find my window. Here's my window. Um, that is all I've got for now. So I'm going to hand it right over to Eric, who is right there in the room. Eric, the mic is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do two complete images, starting from stacked images. Uh, that have been calibrated and picks inside all the way to the final image in Photoshop. Uh, let's let's just get going. That's the best thing to do. Let's share a screen. Let's see. Share this screen. Share. Screen failed to start. Adam? Is that the same thing that happened to us last time? Same thing that happened to us last time. Let me just try again. It was just working 10 minutes ago, though, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Um, so, so let's go over to duplicate. Stop sharing. What are these? Uh, right now, I see your desktop. Hmm. Is okay, this... what I'm, what I'm going to do is we're going to stop sharing. Sorry about this. And let's go over to display sharing and duplicate. Isn't that what we did? Last time, uh, keep ch keep changes. Let's try it this way, Adam. Give me just a moment. Okay. All right. Let's try it again. One more time. Share. How are we doing? I think we got it. I think we got it. Okay, it's going to be a little trickier, but uh, yeah, I see your Hangout screen right now. Yeah, hold on a second. I got to get that out of the way. Okay, let's get going. We're going to move things around. We're going to get rid of the processing console. So let's start out. First, we're going to do a Hubble pilot image. So I'm going to open up three images to start with, and they are the three narrowband images: hydrogen alpha sulfur, and oxygen. These were all taken out at the SARA remote observatories. Let's open. These three right here. Now these are stack calibrated but linear images, so we don't really see much until we do an automatic stream stretch. So let's do that. And I just had a comment earlier about how little information you see in sulfur versus hydrogen alpha. And that's really true. That's very bright, a lot of detail in it. But in the sulfur, you can still see the structure of the cave nebula. And oxygen the same way. Now, these are all registered to a single image, including the RGB, which I'm going to do a little bit later. So normally, I would go through a more refined screen stretch. 
Uh, but this time around, just because it would take a little too much time, I'm not going to do that. Also, some of the other processes that we're going to go through, like the noise reduction, when I get up to the color images, I'm going to short those. And I've already processed those images, and I'll just bring those up. So right now, I'm just going to bring up the histogram transformation, which is let me jump over here. And I'm just going to do a default screen stretch according to the screen transfer function. And you see with the histogram, there really isn't much showing on the histogram. I'm going to drag that over there. And now we have a nonlinear image. Now this guy is always going to be in the way, isn't he? Get rid of him over here. Get rid of the automatic stretch. And now we have our default stretched image for hydrogen alpha. And we're going to do the same thing for the other two narrow bands. Default screen stretch. Stretch, turn off that. It's a little bit awkward having duplicate screens, but I think we'll muddle along here. So now we have three nonlinear images. Hydrogen alpha is obviously the brightest, but you can still see those structures in the sulfur and the oxygen. So normally what I would do right now is do a noise reduction. And we're going to use technique that uh, David has described before using TGV denoise. Uh, let's see. So I'll make a clone copy of that, mask it, invert the mask, and hide the mask, and bring up TGV denoise. And let's just do a small section of this just to illustrate how that works. See, this is not a very noisy image, but I'm still going to do the denoise noise reduction on the preview. And there you see we've really maintained most of the structure. Let me rock that back and forth. So the stars look all right, the structure looks all right. So I think that level on TGB denoise is pretty good. And we're going to do the whole noise reduction for that structure. For the whole image. Now this is one of the places where I'm going to short circuit this. Yep. So now you have to assume that I've done the noise reduction on the hydrogen alpha and on the sulfur and on the oxygen K nebula. I've saved them as TIP files. So even though you don't see that, let me just close these images. Yeah, I know. I'm not using it anymore. So now I have the three narrow band images, hydrogen, alpha, sulfur, and oxygen, which are nonlinear, which have been stretched, which I've adjusted the histogram slightly and saved as TIFF files. So now let's open up Photoshop. And now these three images are open in Photoshop. Noise reduced, stretched, and I've made some adjustment in the histogram in order to bring out a little more of the structure of the cave. Now, in order, so we got uh, that one's hydrogen alpha. So now we're going to make the default Hubble palette image. And in that case, the hydrogen alpha is assigned green, sulfur is assigned red, and oxygen is assigned blue. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a copy of, say, the hydrogen alpha. Go all, copy, new uh, from the clipboard, create. And I'm going to make this an RGB image, not a grayscale. Bring up the channels and paste that into the green channel. OK, that's our green. And we don't need that image anymore. So now I'm going to go back and take the oxygen, make a copy of that, paste it into the blue channel, 
don't need that anymore. And get the sulfur channel, copy, and paste that into the red channel. So what color is that going to be? It's going to be green. And if any questions come up, you know, please let me know. Will do. Okay. So that's not a very interesting looking Hubble palette image. So what we have to do is we have to balance out that histogram and then make a couple of adjustments to the histogram in order to bring out the Hubble palette. Now, what I've done here is not going to work because as soon as I start adjusting that histogram, those stars are going to have to have halos around them. And that's not going to work at all. And we're going to have purple halos around an otherwise good image. So I don't really want this image. So we're just going to close it. So here's what I do want. Nope, we're not going to save it. I'm going to open up again. This image. So in order to combine them properly, I really have to get rid of those stars so that when I stretch the histograms for the two other channels besides the green, the red and the blue, then I won't have any stars to stretch and any halos that created. And first thing I have to do is get rid of those stars. Now there are a couple techniques to get rid of the stars. The most the easiest one is to use a pre-programmed action. Now where are my actions? action here and if we look down to Annie's action uh, let's see there is remove stars large image let's play that action oh stars almost gone but stars aren't completely gone you see these residues of stars over here so now I usually take about 15 20 minutes even as much as a half an hour to go through and get rid of all these. Uh, let's see, where's my little tool here? I'll go through. Oh, that's kind of messy. And actually, if I zoom in on this, I will see lots of little stars. Let's just zoom in that I have to get rid of. All these little star residues, you have to go through in order to have a decent image. See these things here? We have to get rid of all of those. Now that takes a lot of time. So I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to assume that I already have taken care of all of those little star residues. And I now have a starless image, hydrogen alpha. So let's close this. I've already made this image. Nope, we're not going to save it. So now let's open up the starless images. Let's see, starless, there's the starless hydrogen alpha, starless oxygen, and starless, oops, wrong, starless that. So now I have the three starless images. So now when I combine them, I will get what's known as a tone map. That is a color background over which I'll layer a light area, which will shine through the color and give me white stars, but no halos around my stars. And I really do the same things I did before. I'll start off with the hydrogen alpha, see lots of details, but no stars. Make a copy of that. New on the clipboard. Create, change it over to a RGB image, open up my channels, and paste it into the green channel. Hydrogen alpha, no stars. Don't need that anymore. Take the oxygen. Uh, you've seen this before. Go over to the new image. Paste it into the blue channel. I uh, don't need that anymore. Sulfur. Paste it into the red channel. 
now we have the beginning of our Hubble palette tone map image. No stars, just color. And now we can start making some adjustments to get to the kind of the orange aqua uh, Hubble palette image that we're probably all familiar with. Just the tone map, not the final image. And I'll do that in a couple different ways. First, I'll make a duplicate. Then we'll get the uh, histograms. And you see the, hy the hydrogen alpha is so dominant that it really dominates us and everything is green. So a simple way to get around that is simply to do a levels, go through each one of the channels and kind of balance them out a little bit. We're going to do kind of a crude adjustment. Red. Green is fine, nice and broad. And blue, doing the same thing. Just Now it's beginning to look like a Hubble palette image, but not quite. So let's make another layer. Histogram layers. So now I'm right, going to write uh, run another action. There's a fellow by the name of Bob Frankie who has come up with a series of color adjustments. I Adam, I sent you the links that showed the link to how to make those color adjustments. And basically, you just go into your your image adjustments and your color balance. And you make three simple adjustments, which I've reduced to an action. And it should be right uh, tone map. Uh, tone map adjustment. I'm going to run this. Oh, now it's beginning to look like a Hubble palette image. Well, I'm going to do one more thing. Let's go to the layers, and I'm going to make one more copy of a layer. Don't need that anymore. And I'm going to run that action again. Get rid of that. Now I think that's a little too orangey. So basically, I'm going to tone this down by just changing the opacity, say, to 50. Now normally I would spend a little time to try to get perhaps more of the aqua color to the orange, but for the purpose of demonstration, I think this is fine. And the one thing I'm going to do with this, this is a little too blotchy. I'm going to do a slight blur on this. So we have the filter. Gaussian blur, and now uh, let's go four pixels. So that's our tone map. Now to convert that to the Hubble palette image with stars, all I have to do is overlay it with the most, most detailed uh, image I have for that, and that's a hydrogen alpha. So if I open up the hydrogen alpha TIFF image again, I make a copy of that, put it on my tone map, convert that to a luminosity layer. That's our Hubble palette image. You can make some adjustments to the, the tone map. Just go back if you want a little more purple, you want a little more orange or more aqua, you can go in and manage that color without actually making any of the bloated stars or stars with halos. And in this case, the stars are all white. And you might say, well, why are the stars white? Uh, the answer is that there really isn't any meaning in a narrow band image to star color. Although some people will go back and put in star color on top of a tone mapped image. Uh, that's not what I do. This is kind of an adapted technique from uh, JP's technique for tone mapping, a link which I also gave to Adam, which he can post. Are there any questions about this tone mapping? Um, you did get one question, and this is the question that gets asked to all of us when we're processing. 
why not use a correction layer in Photoshop? Correction for? Uh, in, uh, I guess he means an adjustment layer. Um, well, actually, if I, that, I use adjustment layers. So when I do this, this kind of image, I'll spend a couple hours on it, and I will put in adjustment layers. So for example, let's say layers. Let's go back here. So let's put in a layer, new adjustment layer. Oh, uh, let's, you know, hue and saturation. Okay, let's just dump that in there. So let's say I want to have more saturation on that. So let's bump up the saturation on the tone map to say 30. Oh, that's a little too bright. So I do use adjustment layers, but that's when I have some more time in order to you know, adjust the color on the tone map. And yeah. I can adjust the color on the tone map and not affect the resolution of the stars or the stars at all because that's the layer that's on top. Another yeah, yeah. thing, I'm He's sorry, saying, uh, an adjustment level, uh, instead of making copies of your layers, uh, I guess uh, as opposed to um, like where you're duplicating the layer, uh, I guess uh, you could, let me think, uh, make the adjustment layer, and then you don't have to technically duplicate it. You're just making the adjustment on top of it. But You can, I, but that's different than, I really have built up these actions in order to do things all at once, like remove the stars, uh, adjust the color, and do a couple other things. And that seems to be easier. But I, I definitely use adjustment layers, and I will group things together. Uh, there are lots of different ways of doing this. And I remember one of the first lectures I went to from someone whose processing I respected. The first thing that he said was, this is the way that I do it. It's not the only way to do it. But this is just the way I do it. So this has kind of evolved to the way I do a Hubble palette image. Yeah, I think in some cases it's just what you're comfortable with. It, it kind of accomplishes the same thing. Uh, with an adjustment layer, if you do an adjustment layer on step two, and then you're on step 10 and you think, if I hadn't done that adjustment layer that way, you can go back and uh, fix it without having to step back through the entire image. But um, a lot of us, I don't know, a lot of us just uh, do it one way and because uh, it's the way we're comfortable with. And I know Josh does adjustment layers. I know Eric does adjustment layers. I never really got around to doing that many adjustment layers. I just kind of work my way up and let myself make the mistake and have to do it all over again. But sorry, well, Eric. You know, no, when, I, when you get done with this, I'll probably end up with 20 or 30 layers, and I will do a, a kind of a catch-all. I'll sum everything up to that point. And then if I have to go back and make you know, a correction to it, then I do that. You know, go back and remove it and see how it comes out. I would guess on this kind of image is probably – six or seven hours before I'm happy with it enough to say, you know, I finally have what I want. I'm looking at this one. I probably could get a little more detail out of it if I go in and do high pass. But we're going to do high pass in the next image. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to get through it, you know, illustrate the process rather than just, you know, produce the final image. Uh, by the way, this is a process tone mapping that I learned from JP. Uh, I have another link that I gave to Adam. And he can post that link, and you can go through and look at JP's process. It's slightly different than this, but the whole idea is you make a color layer, and you get your detail from your overlay layer. But for example, the, the luminosity layer of HA, I generally put in a little of the starless image from sulfur and oxygen to make it a little more balanced. But that takes a little more time, so I'm not going to do that tonight. Any more questions on the tone mapped image? Nope, you might as well move on. Okay, so let's get rid of this. Uh, we're not going to use this. I'm not going to use this, but I am going to go back. No, we don't need this. I'm going to open up one more document here. Let's open up the Starless. Uh, I'm going to need that in a few minutes. So let's go back to PixInsight. 
So generally now when I have an emission nebula, I start off with the Hubble pellet because the hydrogen alpha is so key to the final image, both for the RGB and the Hubble pellet, that hydrogen alpha is really the key image to get. And the reference image that is used throughout the whole capture is always the best image from the hydrogen alpha. That shows as much of the detail as is possible, much more than RGB or sulfur and oxygen. But now let's do an RGB image. So I'm going to open up the three R, G, and B images that we captured actually just recently. Now with RGB, you see a lot more of the structural detail than you do with the sulfur and oxygen. In fact, they look relatively the same. And if you looked at the histograms, they're much more similar, even though hydrogen alpha is the most, uh, the strongest emission in an RGB image. Now we've been through how to make an RGB image before in the astroimaging channel, so I'll go through that all relatively quickly. You know, working with one duplicated screen is driving me nuts, Adam. <laughs> so let's go through channel combination process. And I think those are already set up. R, G, and B. And we'll do that on a global scale. And there's our RGB image. We'll do the auto stretch. And that's not a bad start for an RGB image. But I see my background is not quite what I want. So I'm going to zoom in on this and do a background correction. Let's right, so go over here. I'm trying to find a spot on the RGB image, which is kind of like a background image. There's a lot of stars here. But let's make this the background, this little area in here. Pick any area which is not necessarily have a star in it, but kind of looks like a background. This is my preview one. And I'm going to do a background neutralization using that process. I will select preview one. I think it's already selected. Preview one. And correct the background. Turn off the auto stretch. Expand the image. Get rid of that. And now do a color calibration of all the stars. Make another preview. In this case, trying to get every all the stars minus a little bit of the unregistered area, which you can see on the edges. This way of, of doing RGB images is well illustrated in probably the first video I saw on PixInsight. So basically, preview two will be all my stars. And my background reference will still be the same, preview one. So we're doing a color correction. Not a bad looking image to start with. I really haven't done much work. Shut that, shut that. Now normally I would go through a more subtle stretch where I do a little bit of stretch. I'd keep my stars small and then stretch the background. But that takes a long period of time. So once again, I'm going to take the shortcut and do the auto stretch from the screen transfer function by just dragging this little caret over to the histogram transformation, use the default stretch, and stretch the image. I don't need these previews anymore. Now the next step will be a, a noise reduction using TGV denoise. That process that process will probably take about five minutes. So I'm not going to do the whole image, but let me just take a little bit of the image and show you how that works. There's my preview. I'll blow up the preview. 
I'll take a copy of this. I will mask it. Invert the mask. Turn off the mask. Look at my preview window and see what, on using these default settings, how much this reduces the noise. Preview should only take a couple of seconds. Uh, that's not bad. I might bump that up just a little bit. Let's say go to six. As David has illustrated before, if you just do this edge protection and go up and down with that, you can adjust the amount that TGV denoise actually changes. So let's see how six will do. That's not bad. Let's rock that back and forth. We still have all the detail in the nebula, and six will do it. So now I would normally go through. I got to stop that from happening. There we go. So normally I would go through and do the whole image and get rid of the noise, adjust the histogram, and save it as a TIFF. Unfortunately, that would take too long. So let's assume that you know five minutes has elapsed. I've done that and I've saved it as a TIFF, and I'm now going to go to Photoshop. I don't need this anymore. I don't need the mask. And I don't need pics inside. So let's open up that image. Uh, let's see, where is it? There it is. So there's my denoised. RGB image of the cave nebula registered to the same frame as the Hubble palette. But you can see that the amount of detail that you have in this image is not near as much as you have over in the stars image, or even if I brought up the one with stars in it. All this detail here is not visible in the RGB image. It's just not there. So we want to bring in this detail into the cave nebula by doing two things. Let's bring up our layers. Let's make a copy of this starless image, and let's paste it on top. That's our HA layer. Now I'm going to make five copies of this. So I think five should do it. Three. I'm going to put those in a folder, open up the folder, turn all these off, and just look at one of these at a time. And I'm going to do something called high pass filtering. There is a filter here called a high pass under other high pass. And what high pass does, it will flatten the image and bring out Let's cancel this off for a second. Let's zoom in on just one area. It'll bring out some of the edge effects in the nebula that are in the HA starless image that you don't see in the RGB image. So let's now go into a high pass. And the adjustment that you have is this radius adjustment over here. I'm not sure, can you see it, Adam? Can you see those little edge effects? Um, I, can, I can see it on my computer subtly. Uh, and we did get a comment from Chad. If you could zoom in, uh, as you did before, it, it sometimes help, helps. And you know um, there's a little lag to the uh, resolution, I guess you'd say. So if you do leave it on your screen, it tends to catch up, at least for me. So what you do for this high pass filtering, I'll start off with a very low radius to the point where I can't really see the edges. Now for one pixel, I can't really see any of the edge effects that high pass will actually reveal to us. So I'll then go up and I'll try two pixels. Uh, can't really see anything on two pixels, so let's try three. Well, I'm beginning to see, I don't know if it's visible, down here you can start to see some of the edges. 
if you looked at the histogram of this, you'd see it would be a very narrow uh, histogram where the edges, the transitions between light and dark area in the image will start to be enhanced. So I'm going to do a three pixel high pass filter and then I'm going to put it in as an overlay. So I'm going to click this. So now this is one layer of high pass at three pixels and I'm going to turn this off and on. And I'm guessing you can't really see the difference. I can see it here, but it's hard to see there. So let's now do another layer. And now let's go to four pixels, high pass. And now these structures will start to kind of reveal themselves. And again, convert that to an overlay image, which just emphasizes those edge. Now, I don't know if you can see it. Turn high pass off. Turn high pass on, and you can start to see some of the edge effects. Can you see those, Adam? Adam? Very, very, very slightly. OK, well, we're going to get more slightly. <laughs> so we'll go to filter, other, high pass. Six pixels. Ah, now you're going to see it. And we're going to have this overlay. Now you're probably getting to see it. And I'll do one more high pass filter at eight pixels. Now, the problem with high pass is you can probably get too much detail and it starts to get a little messy, but we'll clean that up a little bit later. So there's our full image. So this is the regular image, and this is the image with high pass. I'll let that catch up. Can everyone see the difference, or can anyone see the difference? Actually, to me, that's kind of obvious, yeah. Yeah. Now, I've gone a little bit overboard, but what this really does, it brings out the edges of the nebula, the transitions between light or light gray and dark gray in the hydrogen alpha, and that brings it to the RGB. Now, normally I would bring this down a little bit, but I think to illustrate the point, I've made it a little more prominent. So that's our high pass filtering. But what's missing in this? What's missing is in this is I can't really see much of the nebula. That should be nice bright red. So I'm going to use another technique. I'm going to lighten it using the hydrogen alpha. This is another technique from Bob Frankie, and I've sent Adam the link to describe how this is done, but let me go through it now. So let's convert that image to RGB. Now it's an RGB image. I'm going to bring out my channels. I'm going to bring out my little, my little pencil, and I'm going to make everything black except the red layer. So that looks kind of odd. So now this is all the emission nebula minus the stars. And I want to bring that red color out in the RGB image. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a copy of that. We're going to bring it over to here. Go back to layers. I'm going to paste this on top. And I'm going to make that into a light and layer. And now our nebula really stands out. Why don't I turn that off and on so we can really see the difference? Without the light and layer, and then with the light and layer. Now let me do one other thing here. I think this layer, this is a little bit noisy. I'm going to make a, let's see, where's our actions? I'm going to do a stamp, which is sum all. Oops, missed. Actions, stamp, play. 
So this is the sum of everything. And I'm going to now just get a rid of a little bit of this noise in here. And I have a filter that's called Noiseware. And we're just going to do a slight noise reduction. Make your noise. And the last thing I'm going to do is just adjust the histogram slightly. Uh, I don't want to clip anything now. We're just going to leave it alone. OK, we're almost done with this image. But there's something wrong with it. What's wrong with it, it's not framed the way I want. And we have these little areas over here where it didn't really register well with the original HA. So let's do two things to begin with. First of all, I'd rather see that cave nebula facing up. So I'm going to take and I'm going to rotate that. Get this guy out of the way. And the last thing I don't like about it, I don't like the way it's framed. So I'm going to crop it. This is really no different than what you do with a camera. You try to frame your image. But in our case, sometimes in order to get the proper guide star in there, we have to take the image, you know, the way the guide star is oriented or the way the, the CCD camera, the size of the chip. But when you're all done, I like to frame it so that it's more of the picture that I want. Let's get that in there. Uh, maybe just a little bit higher. So we're going to crop it. Oh, I forgot one more thing. We got the little unregistered portion right there, don't we? Put it in the frame. Oh, there's one thing I forgot to do. There's a little bit of green in here, which I don't want, so I got a little filter to take care of that. Uh, deep sky. And there's our image. So the next thing I want to bring up is the a point image. Let's That's our image. The color isn't perfect, but it's pretty much the same as what I submitted. Looks like uh, you your stars were slightly more saturated in the iPod. I and think, I they were, and the, the stars were smaller, but then I was able to go through and actually do some star reduction and some different kind of stretching in PixInsight, which takes a little more time. Yeah. But the process is still the same. Yes. Yeah. And Eric, Eric, Eric and I were discussing this before the session. When you're doing these tutorials, you're giving people an idea as to uh, the set of instructions to use, but there's a lot of uh, tweaking that you probably wouldn't be able to perceive in the presentation via uh, with the resolution it has, but um, it uh, gives you a, a pretty good basis. Let's move this over. Maybe we can get a little fairer would you, comparison. Eric, would you mind listing some of the uh, plugins or uh, actions that you've used in Photoshop, particularly the ones that uh, are like third party? OK, as far as Photoshop, I use Annie's action for uh, noise reduction or for getting rid of the stars. I've actually made my own action based on JP's process, but I found that Annie's action is a little bit, a little bit more comprehensive. Although sometimes I revert back to mine. Uh, Annie's been on the show, right? She's yes. Given, so this is Annie's action 7.0, and it has remove stars large. I also use her process to make stars a little smaller sometimes uh, before I do star removal, but then that takes a little bit more time. And the other things that we use, let's see, filter. I use the deep sky color. I think that's a free plugin that you can get with Photoshop to get rid of the green stars. 
getting rid of green is not so much an issue with nebula, but when you go into galaxies, you often end up with some green stars. And the other thing that I use is the Imagetronic Noiseware. And also, sometimes when I get close to the end, I'll remove this image. Say I save this, I move it back into PixInsight, and I'll do some more subtle TGB denoise, getting rid of that noise in PixInsight rather than in Photoshop. I'm just taking a shortcut here. Now, the other thing is with noise reduction, you have to be very careful. You don't want to go too far with that. Otherwise, your image will look a little plasticky. And who was it? One of the, uh, the PixInsight guys refers to this as comfort noise. In other words, when you zoom in on it, you have to see a little noise. Otherwise, it doesn't look like a natural image. Now, I've got to say this one probably doesn't have enough noise to it. And oftentimes, what I'll do, if it doesn't have enough noise, I'll take the original image, which has noise in it, I'll layer it on top, put it in at about maybe 10%, and I get my comfort noise. Uh, I think I've said to a few people, there are three things you don't want to see being made, sausages, laws, and astral images. So when we reveal some of these little things you do, you say, well, that's kind of cheating. And the answer is, well, this isn't science. This is making pretty pictures. Any more questions, Adam? Um, I didn't see any uh, more questions pop up in that. Uh, you've got a well done and a beautiful work, and uh, Jeff loves the expertise he gets. Uh, it was a great presentation. It's a great image. Um, now, Eric does have the benefit of shooting from remotely from some really nice skies, uh, but, but then again, he still bases the uh, luminosity of the image off the H-alpha. So it is. Well, no, the, the luminosity is not off of H alpha. The luminosity for the Hubble palette image is really over lum with uh, H alpha. But for this, luminosity, there is no luminosity image for emission nebulas. It's just R, G, and B. The hydrogen alpha gives the detail of the emission right, right. Yeah. and brings out that the red of the emission, which is if you could actually see it with your naked eye, which we can't, that's what it would look like. It would look red. I don't know how much that red comes across, but it should be kind of reddish. Yeah, on the, on the image I'm looking at, uh, on my screen, I can definitely see it. It's, I don't know, the, the red that, uh, basically that detail in the red channel just uh, comes out. Um, can I what, bring up one, Adam, can I bring up one more thing? Absolutely. Um, let's see. Let's just minimize these. Let's bring up, we just finished another image, which I think I showed you before. Let's see if I can bring it. Give me just a moment to navigate this. Um, nope, it's, oh, here it is, the elephant, oh, crap, patience, patience, Eric, here it is. So this is the same kind of image as before. Basically, this is an RGB image where all the detail is really brought out with the hydrogen alpha. And then the red of this whole image around the elephant trunk is brought out with the HA as well. So this is the same kind of image. Just finished it uh, a few days ago. OK, I think we're done. If there are any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, any questions out there? Type them into our chat. I know you guys know where to type them. Um, and I'm running my mouse over the right-hand side of that image to make sure that I don't have two dots on my uh, screen. But uh, nope, those are uh, globules, right? Oh, no, those those globules, those, yeah, right around here, 
No, no, no. Those are real. <laughs> that is absolutely real. I can't clean them off my screen, no matter how much I wipe. Oh. But they are only present in the HA. You really don't see those in the RGB image. I think those are the globules that uh, Josh was talking about. You know, in his presentation a while back. Although, you know, you're never going to get that. Okay. Can I stop sharing? Are we done? Yeah. All right, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, oh, how much integration time you got uh, a question on? Actually, you got a quest that question on both images. Uh, the elephant trunk, I think, was 20 hours. A good bit of that was HA. And the, I think the cave nebula was about 30 hours in total. And for RGB, the usually no more than nine hours of RGB. A good bit of that is hydrogen alpha, the remainder, and usually just one night of oxygen and sulfur, which means three or four hours of each one. That's kind of how it adds up. Awesome. Thank you. Um, in uh, next week's uh, presentation is going to be out uh, by Alex. Um, I have the term, the wording here a little wrong, but switching from a DSLR or upgrading from DSLR to dedicated AstroCam, uh, which is a popular topic, and uh, I'm sure Alex will have a lot of good insight. Uh, again, thank you, Eric, for this presentation. Um, it's not so often we get to see an APOD image in the works, so uh, very cool. Uh, and uh, if no one else has any other comments. I'm going to end it for the night. But uh, again, to all you out there, thank you. And we'll see you next week. Good night.